Welcome everyone. My name is Becky Flax. I am on the membership committee for the Surface Design Association, a membership nonprofit focused on contemporary fiber and textile art. I'm delighted to welcome you to this week's Textile Talk, Changing Course, a panel of career paths. Textile Talks webinars are brought to you by the International Quilt Museum, Quilt Alliance, San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles, Studio Art Quilt Associates, and Surface Design Association. We are excited to begin promoting our 2022 online conference, Community Ties. Mark your calendars for January 22nd and 29th. Community Ties celebrates the many connections we share as artists and makers. The conference will include more than 15 hours of programming spread across an entire week with weekend programming, including artist talks, presentations, and panels. Weekday programming will include demos, meetups, a SDA open house, and more. The conference will be recorded and available until the end of March, 2022. Registration information will be coming soon. So before we get started, a few housekeeping announcements. This is a webinar. Your cameras and microphones are not active. We welcome questions, which we'll answer at the end of all of the artist presentations. Please submit them in the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. We are honored to bring you free and inspiring Textile Talks programming. We respectfully ask you be courteous as you engage with speakers, moderators, and other participants. Your chat comments can be seen by everyone. Please use the Q&A for questions, the chat box for greetings, and the survey for commentary or ways we can improve. If you prefer not to see notifications from the chat, you can click on the chat bottom button at the bottom and toggle them on or off. This webinar would not be possible without the support of our sponsors. Sponsors include Motive Fabrics and Supplies, Quilting Daily, Arafil, eQuilter.com, Artistic Artifacts, Clover, Empty Spools Seminars, Misty Fuse Detached, Nine Patch Fabrics, Quilt Mania, Schiffer Publishing, Thai Silks, and TheQuiltShow.com. Today, we have the immense joy of sharing the work and experience of three outstanding makers who took courageous leaps into the unknown of fiber arts and textile design. Our first presenter today is Naomi Velasquez. Naomi S. Velasquez is an award-winning contemporary textile and book artist. Naomi holds an MFA from the University of North Texas in studio art and fibers. Naomi's work was included in Quilt National 2021 and 2011 and received the most innovative use of Medium Award in 2011. Naomi is an associate professor and chair of the Department of Art at Idaho State University in Pocatello, Idaho. She is the coordinator for fiber, media, and paper making areas. Her work is held in numerous private and public collections, including the Cynthia Sears Collection, University of Denver Library, Emory University Library, Kimmel Harding Nelson Center for the Arts and the University of North Texas Special Collection. Thank you so much, Naomi, for sharing your work. Hello, everyone. I'm joining you from Idaho today, and I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And play my slideshow. Can you guys see that? Okay, I'm gonna take that as a yes. Um, I have on my first slide here, a gratuitous picture of my grandchild because my work is about relationships. And for me, it's important to keep reminding myself that as we go forward. Um, I am currently an associate professor at Idaho State University and I teach art, which is a privilege. So what I'd like to show you is a little bit of how I got here. My mom and grandmothers sewed 
all of our clothing as kids. In the top left corner, you can see a picture of my siblings and myself and some hand smock, hand sewn clothing. I think the turtlenecks were the only things my mom didn't make. On the top right, you can see um, a very nerdy picture of my sisters and myself in the tree in our backyard. We were raised pre-internet and my family had an intense focus on reading and music. In the middle picture, you can see an image, um, a letterpress print that I've made. My dad and grandfathers were all engineers and my aunts and mom were in the arts and humanities. And then the picture on the right, the skull represents the, the fact that I consider every day to kind of be a gift, the idea of memento mori. Um, I lost a, a really good friend when I was 17. And I think that affected kind of my whole trajectory as a human being from there forward. And the bottom left corner, you can see me teaching paper making in my bright green apron. So I started off with a design degree and did education jobs at nonprofits, which led to my interest in teaching art. So at the bottom right corner, it's kind of full circle. I don't think it's a surprise that I make books and textiles because of my history um, and background with books and textiles. So hopefully that's a little bit of a visual narrative. And then this is a lot of words on a screen, but I just wanna start because we're talking about career transitions today. Um, I got an undergraduate degree in interior design in 1999. And for those of you kind of unfamiliar with that, um, many programs are either art-based or architecture-based, and ours was very architecture-based. Um, I had the idea that I should get a job and get a degree that directly led to a job. Um, so I decided an interior design degree would serve me well. Um, I went into the workforce and worked as a designer in the office furniture industry and pretty much immediately realized that I was not going to be happy um, making a gross profit for someone else for the rest of my life. So I loved it, but it wasn't as creative as I thought it would be. Um, so I started volunteering um, with sexual assault advocacy groups and the Dallas Children's Hospital, and I started making art quilts. Um, from there, I kind of switched gears, and for 10 years, I worked in various nonprofits. I worked with adults with developmental disabil disabilities, medically fragile adults and children. Um, I was a foster parent. And I continued working with survivors of sexual assault and family violence. Um, to counterbalance the kind of difficult work I was doing in nonprofits, I was making art quilts furiously at night. And so I kind of came to a head um, where with a bachelor's degree, I was really grateful for all the opportunities I was able to pursue, but it became clear that my job options were limited and I kind of was getting a little bored at work and so I decided I needed to either go back and get a master's of fine arts or a master's of social work um, so that I could have more job opportunities. So I chose art and kind of gambled on getting an art degree um, in my thirties and I was able to get a degree in fibers in Texas and then I was lucky enough to get a job working as an artist and professor. So it was kind of an exciting road over the past 20 or so years. So I just wanna show you a little bit about the work that I'm making, um, that I've just finished making. So this is an image. I like to show inspiration images. Um, there are many facilities near us that have some of this work in their museums. Um, so I was able to see some of this in Utah, um, these beautiful Azmat shields. And my work is about relationships. So these immediately spoke to me as this barrier between a person and war, um, in terms of these war shields. So I wanted to make a piece that reflected that. So here's some sketches from my sketchbook. Um, these pieces are made, they are made of quilts that I have dyed the batting and reconstructed them. Right now you're seeing the exposed batting in two colors of pink and red. And then I re-adhere them with an adhesive to another quilt that you can see behind it and it's covered with matte medium, so they'll stick together. And I'm thinking about layers and textures and how the work changes as you walk past it, much like relationships change every minute 
in my perspective. So this one's called Protege. And that's based on the idea of this asthma shield, thinking about who are we protecting ourselves from and who are we opening up to in relationships. I'm also interested in textures, cellular structures, anatomy images, vintage book illustrations. I own way too many books. We can never move again. Um, I'm interested in food and the relationship that people have relating over food, drawings, knot diagrams, historic embroidery samplers, mushrooms, and then self-referential things like making work about weaving textiles and knitting. And I think that relates to the fact that I teach those things. And so they're very much in the forefront of my mind. So I just wanna show you a couple more things. I do have a timer to make sure I don't go over my time. Um, this is a darning sampler. I love teaching embroidery and these darning samplers are just phenomenal. I just love the idea of these samplers and how gorgeous they are as objects. Um, so I just recently made an artist book edition last year. And I think that the idea between me being a textile artist and a book artist is very clear in this particular edition. Um, I've got some letterpress work, uh, pressure printed and then made with polymer plates, found maps, and you can see that I'm stitching some embroidery sampler images on top of them here. There's a pressure printing plate, which I actually stitched to the pressure printing plate. Um, here's some books folded and ready to be assembled. And then here's an image of this book piece an edition of eight artist books. And each one is slightly different. It's a, a variable edition because each map image is not a color copy. It's an actual found map image from an atlas. And there's the outside of it. It's made with handmade paper. I also teach paper making here at ISU. And so that has added a whole nother thing to my work where if I can make the paper, I certainly will. Okay, and then the last thing I wanted to show you is some images of some virus work that I did. Um, interestingly, as soon as COVID happened, I became um, completely uninterested in making any more. But up until that point, I was making work about viruses. Um, Zika really affected me, this idea that um, women were being really at risk um, with their newborn babies and when they were pregnant. And so this idea of things that we couldn't control was already on my mind before the pandemic happened. So I'm interested in all of those images of cell structures. And so I took some found quilted objects and embroidered on them to try to patch and repair them. They were damaged in many ways. Um, so I was trying to fix the fabric and holes in them and recover them. And then I glued them inside books that I cut out a circle to reference um, an actual image of a slide. I'm thinking about looking things in Petri dishes. And then I clamped them together and put plexiglass on top of them. And then there's an image of a finished book that was about the flu using the inspiration from flu cell diagrams. And then here's one about the coronavirus, which was the last one that I made in this series. Okay. So I look forward to answering your questions about work and career paths. And this is my Instagram, email, and website. If you ever have any questions, let me know. Thanks, Becky. Thank you, Naomi. That was absolutely fantastic. And we look forward to bringing you back for questions at the end. Thank you so much. Thanks. Our next presenter is Drew McKevitt. Drew McKevitt is a textile designer artist from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and currently living in Petawawa, Ontario. She received a bachelor's degree in English literature and creative writing from Concordia University and spent many years working as the managing editor of a poetry magazine in Montreal. She recently received a master's degree in textile design from Philadelphia University. Specializing in knitted textiles, her interests include fashion, performance textiles, and textile art. 
she is drawn to unusual textures, intricate structures, and organic shapes. Her work explores materiality, contradiction, metaphor, and intuition. Thank you so much, Drew, for sharing your work with us. Thank you, Becky. That was very nice. Thank you so much for asking me to, um, to participate in this panel. So I'm going to try to share my screen and present the slides I have. Oh, my goodness. Prepared. So um, yeah, hi, I'm Drew. I'm a textile designer and artist who specializes in knit. Um, and yeah, in Petawawa. So since Becky kind of gave the introduction, I don't have to worry about spewing all of my <laughs> background education. But I, I, so it's true, I started in uh, English lit, creative writing, and philosophy was my minor in undergrad. And then I worked for probably about 10 years as uh, the man at, well, events first as an intern and then eventually as a managing editor of a poetry magazine, uh, Vallum, based in Montreal. So um, there I was like copy editing. I still actually do a fair bit of proofreading freelance. Um, yeah. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I'm a little nervous. Uh, so yes, so I, my background is in writing and editing and I used to write poetry. Um, and then in 2015, quite a bit changed in my life. Um, everything, everything kind of changed. And so I had this opportunity to go back to school and I took it and I decided to go do a master's degree in textile design. Uh, and I, I did this, I had no previous design experience. Um, I did hand knit and I, I always loved design and art, but nothing formal. Um, so I thought for this presentation, I would just kind of take you through some of my work. I would like to note that, you know, I finished the degree in 2018. So I don't feel like I'm totally settled into a textile design career as a new career but I feel like maybe I can speak to some of the, to the way that I navigated this change since it happened so recently, or in many ways is still happening. Um, so I thought I would start by actually talking about my graduate thesis, uh, which I called All is Flux. And I use the fragments by the ancient Greek philosopher Heraclitus as uh, the fragments that he had that pertain to change and flux. And it was definitely a conscious decision at the time because so much was changing for me um, in terms of like career and my path in life in many ways. Uh, you know, because when I started the program, I thought, oh, my my writing background is going to be basically useless. But I found a way to kind of reverse that and think about it more as a not necessarily a benefit, but just how can this experience help me with what I'm trying to do now? So kind of reaching back into my academic past and looking at philosophy as an inspiration, as opposed to a more visual cue was really interesting for me. And also, and uh, like comforting, like I really like that quote, it is in changing that things find repose, um, because change can be such a uh, so difficult and such an upheaval. But uh, what it became about was abstracting a tangible fabric. Um, I designed fabrics and a few garments for the for this collection. And it became about like abstracting something visual out of something that is verbal. And it works for me because for me, design and writing are really both about communication. So for this, it was like, you can see it's very organic. It's about opacities. There's about, you know, about identity, um, organic movement. It kind of boiled down to like a, a repeat and repeats in textiles are so important, but like, is there a way to repeat things in a very organic way or repeat just a small sequence of something and change it as you're creating the fabric? Um, I also got really obsessed with this idea of diagonal pleats in knitting um, because they seem so opposite. Um, 
to use this really soft knit fabric, but then put a really sharp edged pleat line through it. So I graduated in 2018 and then I moved back to Canada. And this is my current setup. This is where I am today as well. I have a studio in my basement and I have three like domestic knitting machines. And this is where I do my development work currently. I do wanna note that um, just in all honesty, so I, I did not get a, a corporate full-time job after finishing my master's program. And I was kind of upset about it at the time, but uh, I've moved on, I, I'm fine with it because I'm doing something I really love, but I kind of wanted to talk about that when, because like the career change thing, you know, it's one thing to tell yourself that, you know, it's going to be difficult to start over in your 30s um, with a new career and you're going to have to start at the beginning and you tell yourself that going into it, but to actually live it is a different thing. And um, you know, I think I wasn't quite prepared for how, you know, I not that I want a senior level job, but just that an entry level job, my expectations don't really meet that anymore. And it's just because my life is more complicated than it was when I was in my 20s. Uh, you know, it's more complicated to move. There's just more moving parts, essentially. But uh, what I have found is uh, I work as a part of Suzanne Audit Hangel's team, and she is a knitwear, I'm sorry, a footwear and uh, a footwear innovator and researcher based in the Netherlands. And this has been a really amazing experience. So obviously I work freelance and remotely, uh, which does have challenges, but it is such a cool setup and it is working out really nicely. So I wanted to show a few examples of personal research I've done for her, uh, not relating to client work. Uh, in some ways, because it is such a, a nice contrast to my very muted organic thesis work, but also because I think it illustrates quite nicely how I connect design to my background in editing and writing. And it, it kind of has to do with the process. Like my process for writing was uh, very like rewriting, essentially. I would just rewrite, rewrite, rewrite until I hit upon, I guess, like the truth or as close to the truth as you might get. And that is the same way that I approach knit design. I resample, resample, resample until I have kind of distilled the idea that I want out of it um, and worked out all the kinks. And, you know, there's so many variables with that, like yarn and, st and structure, et cetera. Um, and here's, these are some more images. Uh, and I think also the copy editing background kind of plays into my approach to design, like the same thrill that I get from finding like a misplaced comma is, is like, it's the same thing as finding a, you know, a needle that's missing instead of knitting. And, you know, oh, well, why doesn't this structure work? Well, what if I adjust this? And being on that level of detail is, um, is kind of where I'm, I'm most happy as a designer. And it makes, and it, it definitely makes sense to me given my personality uh, and fussiness with uh, copy editing. I just, yeah, I threw this in as just kind of an overall uh, what I'm interested in across the board with design or artwork. I love playing with unconventional materials um, and experimenting. It kind of goes back into that iterative sort of process. Um, also traditional techniques, right now I'm very, very into tatting, although I don't know that I do it exactly properly. Um, I started looking at this technique when I was working on my thesis because I, I thought, oh, like you can repeat the gesture, the this tatting stitch, which is like two half half hitch knots. And but you don't have to make it a pattern. You could be really intuitive about it. And that that's really interesting to me. Um, it's kind of morphed into two series, I guess, that I'm that I work on. Um, one is called Specimen, which I take little twigs and 
things that I find when I'm walking around. I, I live in a real, really rural area right now. So I find lots of little bits. And then I like to just uh, tat around them with a very thin uh, cotton thread. And I like, there's something really frivolous about this that I love and it's, it's very meditative for me. Um, and I don't, I try not to put a lot of restraint on it because it is a, a, a moment to kind of just let things happen, I feel. And similarly, uh, I started making these during the pandemic. Uh, I've been calling it invasive species and they're kind of just kind of big tassels in a way, but uh, abstract, like just kind of looking at tatting and the way that I was doing that and thinking, oh, can I do it slightly differently? And what would happen? Um, yeah, and so you can see in this slide, like um, you can see that it starts off, maybe the middle one is a good example, super tiny, and then it builds into something really quite big and, and strange. And this project is also honestly just about working with really colorful thread that's that's giving me pleasure and making, you know, just a nice experience overall. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna, that I would just uh, like to say thank you. And um, I, in conclusion, uh, you know, I guess I've, what I'm trying to get across with this is to sort of say like, uh, I'm trying to find ways of making my past experience inform and help me with my current experience or my what I'm trying to do now in textiles. And uh, you know, it is really about communicating and storytelling. And I think design and writing for me are, are very similar in that. Like they both distill down to that idea. Um, and also just, I, I really love to continue to learn. Like I always wanna learn a new technique or something. And that has been very useful so that not being afraid to be a beginner or make a mistake when trying something new, that has been quite useful to me because um, it, it frees you and it allows you to be more open and kinder to yourself. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. I hope that's it. And I will stop my share. Hey, that was Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing. And I know that there are a lot of outstanding questions for you as well coming up in a little bit. So thank you so very much. And so our last presenter is Aaron Fine. Originally trained as both a sculptor and an architect, Aaron Fine found his way to fabric and thread as a way of healing in the aftermath of September 11th, 2001. After a decade of stitching his monumental White Flags project, 193 national flags rendered entirely in white thread on white fabric, he turned his attention exclusively to digital embroidery. Exploring the medium with an almost scientific rigor, he developed and refined a unique method of creating form by manipulating light over differently hatched angles of embroidered thread. These articulated patterns of light Activated by a viewer's motion, provide the foundation upon which he draws, collages, paints, and illusionistically sculpts three-dimensional architectural experiences. Fine's work has been exhibited both nationally and internationally and has received various distinctions, some of which include shortlisting for the 2018 Australian Tapestry Design Prize for Architects and winning the Surface Design Association's 2017 Award for Innovation and Technique. Thank you so much, Aaron, for sharing your work with us. I look forward to seeing it. Thank you so much, Becky, and thanks to SDA for having me. Uh, and it's also very happy to hear about Naomi and Drew's work as well. Uh, this topic of change in course really spoke to me because I um, have parlayed a, a, a career and a practice of architecture and sculpture into now working exclusively with uh, embroidery. And the bridge between these two worlds, while uh, they were, it was totally unexpected, was this project called White Flags. And this project started in the months after 9-11, when I had seen 
all these American flag bumper stickers, uh, which was all around me, slowly fading in color towards white, uh, just from exposure to the elements. And I really felt compelled to make, in some way, represent this uh, white flag uh, in fabric. And so I had no experience sewing, really. And I approached the problem as a sculptor. I went to a sewing class. I learned about the French seam and started attaching panels to one another and embroidering onto them these white stars and other uh, national symbols. And the result, which I also wasn't expecting, was this uh, these flags that changed their meaning as the light changed around them. Um, I was kind of captivated by the notion that you can have a flag kind of read it with a specific national identity, but then as the light changes, have them all kind of fade, uh, fade out to white in terms of this global collective. So pretty early on, the, the project to me became about the world of flags, and that world was defined by the 193 uh, flags of the United Nations states. And uh, this project was not a quick project. It took 10 years to make. And in that time, while I was making them, I um, was working as an architect. I was raising small children. And I didn't have uh, you know, the, the capacity to really kind of output this with what I was using before, which was you know, a needle and thread. And so I realized I would need to use uh, digital embroidery, which is something I kind of seen at a store, but I knew nothing about it. So I researched it, I invested in a uh, domestic uh, sewing and embroidery machine and just learned the technology. Um, and just how the flags kind of became about light early on in the project, um, the embroidery started to be informed by that. Uh, I noticed that if you have embroidery stitches hatching in opposite at opposite angles to each other, you can either see it as light or dark. And so I just started to incorporate that into the flags as well. After the project uh, was over with the flags, I was just really interested in working with embroidery as a drawing tool. And uh, the subject matter you know, I gravitated to was back in the world of architecture, specifically with these uh, wireframe CAD models from you know, 3D modeling software. And these, the two digital embroidery tools that I was using at the time really allowed me to translate what I was seeing on the screen uh, into thread on fabric. Um, and so this was still just like early stages and just the beginning of what I was kind of hoping to achieve because for me, all my work goes back to ideas about architecture and space. And if I wanted to get embroidery to start to communicate ideas of space, it was gonna to have to be a lot bigger. So I think at the time I just Googled biggest embroidery machines um, and you know I located uh, the, the, the largest machine that had a three foot square hoop. And I found a, a shop that was a couple hours away from me. And I called them, I said, can I stitch out one of my files on your machine? And they said, yes. And then I spent about two weeks on my really rudimentary uh, embroidery software setting up a file. And the morning that I got to this shop and was ready to stitch it out, I got really scared because I hadn't worked at that scale before. And I'm still pretty new to you know, like embroidering like these new things. And I feared, what if this fails? So I uncharacteristically went on Facebook and told people what I was up to and said, if this, if this just doesn't work, you're not going to hear from me a while from for a while because I will uh, be back to the drawing board. Uh, fortunately, the test came out. You know, it was a successful test, and it really communicated nicely online. Uh, so much so, so that some architect friends uh, had asked me, you know, while I was doing it, can this be done as an architectural application? And of course, I said yes, not really knowing, but just wanting to find out. And um, then we started to discuss what this project might become. So we went back to this idea of this shape, the torus, which I was captivated with and they were captivated with. And they said, maybe it's a wall of these things. And um, what was nice about this project, really, really nice, was that the architects really gave me a ton of leeway to, to define what the project would be. Their only real requirement was that the project be very muted um, almost like white on white, hearkening back to the flags, because the wall 
in this apartment was 65 feet long and seven feet high, and they didn't want the, uh, you know, the embroidery on the surface to be overpowering the space. Instead, they would wanted uh, the clients to be able to discover things in this project slowly over weeks, months, and years. Um, so I ended up investing in an industrial embroidery machine, and um, I started to you know, drill down on some of these forms to understand them more. And even though I was still using lines to kind of draw these things out, I was starting to realize that they were faceted surfaces. And the biggest breakthrough for the project came when I stopped relying entirely on drawing with lines and started to fill in some of these areas which, with hatched thread. And I started to notice, as you can see, like with this kind of pyramidal form, that from two different angles, it reflects light differently. And it kind of looked like glass. And suddenly, that the whole game changed for me. And what I started to realize with more and more tests was that, was that it wasn't just simple forms that I could describe light with, but it was more complex forms as well. Um, so just to orient to you, like this saddle shape is uh, entirely monochromatic. Otherwise, it's stitched with only one white thread. But the lighting effects are only uh, are all just through the different hatch angles and different positioning uh, and reflecting of the light. Uh, here's a video actually that shows you know some of these effects, uh, how they feel when you are moving around them, and how you know subtle these things can be. So this is the space where the uh, project was. Um, as on the right, you can see what's the beginning of the wall. That's probably about a third of the wall at most. And here's another location on the project with these uh, bar doors. But this illustrates, um, you know, from looking from one side to the other, how the embroidery illuminates differently. Also from like nighttime to daytime. What I really love was how the, the threads kind of reflected like all aspects of the atmosphere around them. Um, another great thing about the project was with the flexibility with the embroidery was that it afforded us the uh, ability to embroider some of these forms on custom upholstery around the apartment. So I had the illusion of you know these the, the, the subject matter of the wall coming out into the into the rest of the space. And what I found very successful about this project, not just um, learning all these new techniques, was you know learning the production of it because I really had to figure it all out. You know how do I kind of uh, model these big forms, then cut them out. You know cut them out from and and just do a portion in a hoop and then um, you know stitch these panels together and then have them installed. So that learning process was. was a success as well, I thought. After the project, I was looking for other kind of containers and different uh, techniques that I can use, you know, to keep using these lighting techniques in, in new ways. And what was good for me about the, uh, the workflow of the computer was that it really um, facilitated the process. Like for example, with this project, I started out laying this out graphically in Adobe Illustrator. I brought these patterns directly into my embroidery software. I determined the stitching. I was able to stitch out a small scale test. It's about 20 inches wide, where I can study the effects, see if they were to you know, my liking. And then I can also present this to the client so that they can see the direction of the project. And then I can take these files directly, individual circles, and blow them up, uh, enlarge them so that I can mount them for a final piece. Uh, this piece is about eight feet wide and it's mounted in these embroidery hoops. And again, after that, I was just ex exploring more forms, like what else could I do with this, uh, with these techniques? And here I start to move back into the realm of textile, um, you know, tapestry and quilt, you know, all of the above. And then this video actually shows um, me learning uh, a new technique, which I learned at that Aram Pentaculum, um, residency where it was the first time I worked with other textile artists. I never worked in that capacity before. And I, they were all using dye and I realized maybe I can start to dye these 
through these threads and um, create new effects that way. And I realized I can take advantage of synthetic threads versus uh, natural threads and synthetic uh, you know, um, fabric versus natural fabric and see what resisted the dye, what took the dye. And so this opened a whole new area for me in the work, which was being able to paint on them. And this shows a side by side, um, which you know, really shows what I felt was like, suddenly there was a lot more depth to, um, to these threads than the original stock colors. Again, looking for more forms. And then I started to think about like, if I'm kind of creating an illusionistic window onto a world that I'm looking onto here, then this window is really like stained glass. And that idea of stained glass started to inform uh, the composition of the embroidery that I was doing uh, from that point. And so this shows like kind of the assembly of a, another piece, the painting of it. And here's another, another video to show, you know, the forms that I kind of modeled in light that as you move right to left, you can begin to see them articulated. And this is another palette, you know, in that, in that um, you know, with that idea of windows. Um, and this is a palette that I'm taking into a new piece that I'm working on, which is kind of going back to a larger scale, about seven feet tall. And this, this piece for me is starting to bring together a lot of the ideas I've worked with, um, specifically this idea of like looking through a window. And now I'm starting to define the architecture of that window with these complex forms that I've used in the past. So like I'm looking through these complex forms, but what I'm looking onto is also these other complex forms in the background. So I'm really starting to layer, layer all these effects. This is uh, the piece starting to be assembled in the studio. And uh, here you can start to see some of that illusion that's, that's uh, taking shape. So wrapping up, I just wanna come back to my orientation as an architect as it shaped this work. Um, not just in its subject matter and uh, experiential effect, but in its production. It's like this inherent reproducibility um, in these embroidery files was always an asset in me wanting to work with this uh, medium because it gives me the opportunity to multiply my efforts uh, and possibly, which would be great, even make the work uh, somewhat profitable. Um, for now, I've been working on researching and developing all these specific techniques within the medium, but my ultimate goal has always been to scale up the work, not just in size, but in numbers, so I can kind of create more numbered edition of works. Uh, for that to happen, I'm going to need to step back more into my role as an architect and, you know, direct the work of others to stitch some of this out, to assemble it, and then at that point I can come back in, uh, you know, bring back in the hand touch of painting and really kind of you know work that that angle of architect excuse me architect and artist back and forth um, so it's all to say that this has been a very long path but I think there's still a lot of potential for it to grow thank you very much was absolutely fantastic thank you so much and thank you to all of our panelists um, let Let's move right into the fantastic questions that have come from our audience. Um, I'm going to try and prioritize the ones related to the panel first, and then we'll move on to more of the, if we have time, to some of the more directed questions. Um, so one of the ones that I think a lot of us are wondering are, how did you overcome your hesitation to dedicate your practice to art? How did you decide to make this change and you know, overcome, I love this, the inertia of your regular lives to work in a different direction? Um, and so Naomi, if you want to kick us off. Sure, I think that's an excellent question. Um, building on what Drew said, I wouldn't say that it was easy. <laughs> like, you know, we're we're talking about all these these things that we've done and like here we are on the other side. And you know, in the middle it's it can be scary and frustrating and it feels dangerous or risky and you know, you you feel like you need to do something, but for me it was um the passion 
that I had um, really helped propel me. Um, but I would say that for many years, I was, I've been doing two jobs, you know, I was doing a day job and a night job, you know, I was volunteering to get experience, which I highly recommend, um, and getting my foot in places and, and learning so many things. Um, I volunteered with SDA, you know, there's amazing opportunities that are there for you. If you just reach out and kind of like grab them. Um, so I would say that the inertia, yeah, I, I get that, right? We all have so many competing responsibilities, but I've also been told that I don't sleep. So it's possible that I have more insane drive than other people. And that has allowed me to switch gears and be okay with it. But I echo what Drew said, that it was um, a difficult process and it, it wasn't always easy. So. Thank you. Drew, would you like to tell us about your feelings? <laughs> sure, yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, like what Naomi is saying, I I feel like I'm very much in the middle of it still. And uh, yeah, it, cannot, it can be quite uh, difficult to balance, like, you know, you need money <laughs> to live, unfortunately. But um, yeah, you... <laughs> I mean, it's just like, it's what I want to do. And it took me a while to get to that point to like admit that in some ways to myself even. So I just have to keep pushing with it. But like I said, I um, I do proofreading still uh, freelance and um, I don't really live, if I like if I lived in a city again, I would have a, a different part-time job. I, I, I mean, I worked fast food here a, a bit as well um, when I first moved back because that's the job that's uh, available. But yeah, I mean, it isn't easy. And uh, like I, Naomi said in her presentation, actually, like she was not happy making a profit for someone else. And, you know, I don't, I, I mean, even before I came back to do this, uh, I wasn't happy with that idea ever. So it is, there is kind of like a balance there of, um, yeah, like how much do you want to give in or, you know, compromise, I guess. So, yeah, unfortunately, there's no easy answer to that. You do have to just figure out how to make it work for you, I think. But yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Drew. And Aaron, what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, my, uh, and just to, I scrolled through some of the, the feed and I saw that the audio was cutting in the so I'm sorry about that. Um, for me, uh, the flip side of, of doing the artwork was uh, raising family. Uh, I chose to really have some more time with my kids, uh, support my wife, who is um, she's a, a journalist and had a fairly hectic lifestyle. Um, so, you know, there was the benefit for me to actually be able to do that. Like that was an opportunity that uh, I would have lost. Did that, um, but that was so. That was kind of how I balanced the two and really took this slow path. Wonderful, yeah. Thank you all for sharing. Um, I think related to that is um, how does your experimental work or your creative work or um, these pieces that you're working on how do they pay you? Um, how what, how do the equipment cost? The hours spent? Um, what are your insights in terms of trade-offs and different opportunities? And then pairing with that, how do you find the projects that you're working on and the collaborators that you work with? And we'll just go right around again. Okay, thanks, Becky. Um, I think that as a fiber artist, I made an actual decisive choice that I wanted to continue making laborious, meticulous, obsessive work. And to do that, sometimes you have to have another way to make money, right? So I would never want to sell a piece of work that would undercut some other artist and how much they deserve to get paid. And so for me to be able to make meticulous, time-consuming, exhausting work, you know, I thought that I would want to try teaching and I really enjoyed it. So now I have this kind of like cool opportunity and I know that not everybody else can do that, but I get to teach and I can pay my bills and then I can feel like I have enough creativity left in me to go and make things because I know my bills are covered. Um, so for me, the teaching 
helps pay for the kind of artwork that I want to make, which is not going to be something that everybody wants to buy or has the money to buy. Um, I love Drew's tatting pieces and I'm thinking about how much time and energy and love are in those, you know, and those are a part of the process that's kind of like just almost like exciting at this point that she can spend that much time working on them, you know, which is enjoyable and fills up your cup. Um, so I think that for me that I chose teaching to help pay for that so I could make work that's pretty insanely obsessive. So. Um, oh, thank you very much about the tat. I love when someone sees that and gets into how fussy that is because that's definitely where I'm into, like that's my <laughs> zone <laughs> for sure. Um, but yeah, uh, so I guess, yeah, how do I pay for, yeah, threads are expensive, like every, you know, supplies are expensive, my equipment is expensive, I actually broke a tensioning arm last week, and that was like, expensive. Um, but I do, um, I do work with Suzanne, and that is paid. And I do uh, my freelancing. And my I have a partner who kind of covers you know, the day to day, but I live, um, I live very simply. I don't, uh, I'm not a big uh, consumer that, you know, like I knit, I knit, so I knit my clothes, right? So that saves, but I mean, you pay for your supplies, but still you're, you're enjoying doing that. So, because for me, yeah, it is more important to like buy a bunch of thread and have, be able to like relax and make something than to like, buy a new outfit so much, or, you know, what, it could be anything, it doesn't have to be an outfit, it could be anything. Um, but I also like, in terms of like the collab, uh, working with Suzanne out of Hengel has been like really wonderful because it's such a, it's not really like a job that I've had in the past. It's very um, cooperative and supportive. And it's like to be given an opportunity to work in knit design and not just plug in knit stitches or work with like a super tight um, schedule of this is what's on trend is is really fantastic. Um, yeah. And I would say for me, um, you know, coming natural world, I, I basically was choosing a different path in the in the end. See my work really fitting in back into you know, back into architecture, just, but I'm, you know, more of an artist that works in that, in that context. So, um, you know, having, being able to speak that language, being able to actually conceptualize a project from the beginning uh, stages, understand how it's going to be built, like all that, all that knowledge that, you know, I developed in years of working in architecture and building um, makes me Text and so I still have relationships with architects and you know while the projects I've worked on have been kind of you know fewer and farther between simply because you know again this period was more defined by you know as much by you know kids um, you know now that again you know into uh, something that you know I've really developed it's into a business practice. Fantastic. Um, yeah, I think this has been amazingly insightful. Um, full disclosure, Drew is my colleague. And so um, someone had asked where I am. I am in Philadelphia University at Jefferson, um, which was formerly Philly U, formerly Philly Textile. Um, and so people have asked how do you find a program that's right for your passion, that's right for what you're doing? And so if you could give a quick answer and then we'll thank all of our guests for being with us, but I wanted to give people the opportunity to see how you made this transition. So, Naomi, if you wanna speak for a moment about the, the where you were able to begin your process. Sure, I'm sorry, I thought you were asking Drew. Yes, um, I would say that looking at you know, your passion for what you want to do. And again, I stepped my foot in the water before I committed full-time, right? So 
I did start doing art things on the side while I was working full time. And so that helped me with that transition. And then talking to people and asking a lot of questions of everyone I met um, doing jobs, like I think is really underrated, right? I encourage our students and graduate students to ask us a thousand questions, like ask, you know, about what you're interested in doing and figure out what the right path is for you. Yeah, I think it depends on like what you want to get out of it for sure. Um, Becky, I, you know, I went to Philadelphia University, so the background makes me very nostalgic. I really loved my time there. Like I, but you know, from my perspective, I jumped into <laughs> trying this totally new field and uh, there was, I put said, I didn't put a ton of pressure on myself actually, surprisingly, but I did want to make it work. And so I was super open to just experiencing it and seeing what it was going to be like and I I had a great time with it and I found that it was quite open um to let me explore like what I wanted to do um but yeah I mean that's not the the only way to do things you can also start smaller and I think that's that's equally as good but yeah and I would say there's, you know, there's a lot to be said for professional programs. Um, you know, I studied architecture, but didn't really want to be in that, you know, specifically that field. But again, it opened up a lot of doors. Columbia for architecture. And it was at the time that computers were really starting to hit and they just wanted to have, you know, as many paper in the studios as possible. And, um, so I came in with an art background and then they, you know, I just found myself working with computers and then that, you know, really put me, pointed me in that direction. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much again to all of our presenters. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, Aaron. Um, please be sure to keep your eyes open for the registration for Community Ties SDA's conference in January. Um, thank you to our sponsors and to Sakwa for hosting us. The recording will be available on YouTube next week, next Wednesday. And please stay tuned for the next Textile Talks next Wednesday, Conversations with the Artist, Intersect Chicago, Part One, presented by Sakwa. Thank you all again.